Well, welcome everybody to this uh, broadcast from Family Voice Australia. I'm here today with the uh, Human Rights Law, Law Alliance Managing Director John Steenhoff. Now we're just going to move into a live video call with him. Thanks for joining us, John Steenhoff. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. Um, so today we're going to talk about the case of uh, Jareth Cock. Uh, Dr. Jareth Cock has been very um, awfully treated by our Medical Board of Australia. So I just want to speak with you today about the stories that you've, we've published from you on our website and uh, just to go through the case the case here. So how did the case of Dr. Jareth Cock begin? Nice to be here, Daryl. Um, yeah, the, the case of Dr. Cock is quite a scary one because it started with an anonymous complaint that was made to the Medical Board Someone had seen social media posts of uh, Dr. Cock on Facebook and, and other platforms and had decided instead of engaging with those posts to make a complaint to the medical board about those posts anonymously and without Dr. Cock's knowledge. Mm, okay, so who are the medical board and what powers have they acquired recently as of about 2008? 2018, well, I mean. <laughs> the medical board is the the, regula the, the regulator for uh, the whole practice of medicine within Australia. And it's their job to make sure that those who are practicing medicine are fit and proper persons. Uh, they administer all of the regulations of doctors throughout Australia and they set down practice guidelines and perform a lot of the administrative functions for the medical profession. They've been given powers under a, a national act, which has been in, incorporated into the law of each of the states uh, to investigate and to discipline uh, doctors where appropriate, to put conditions on their, uh, their medical practice registrations. And uh, those powers have incrementally been expanded uh, over time to, to give them more powers to intervene in the practices of doctors. So in the case of Dr. Cock, the medical board decided once they had seen Dr. Cock's posts on social media that they wanted to use powers to act immediately. And they went under a part of the law that was just introduced in 2018, which allows them to act when they consider that it is in the public interest. So they determined that on the basis of posts that they saw from, from Dr. Cock, on conservative political issues, on issues uh, of religion, on issues re relating to his deeply held beliefs on when life begins, when it should end, on transgenderism, and even an article that he'd written in Eternity News on the science behind transgender ideology. They decided seeing that, that before investigation, before having a trial, before allowing Dr. Jareth Cock to uh, speak for himself or defend himself, they would take immediate action to suspend his registration. Mm, it's a deeply concerning, isn't it? So how did they, the Medical Board of Australia then uh, deal with the complaint and what are the implications for transparency of justice? Well, it's, it's really interesting. The, the law that regulates the Medical Board states that if they receive a complaint and that complaint is malicious or ill-founded, that they can dismiss it immediately. And in the case where they receive a complaint from an anonymous person about social media posts, I would have thought they would have responded fairly quickly and said, sorry, we don't want to engage with that. If you don't like the ideas that he is, uh, is putting out there in social media, meet those ideas with ideas. But they didn't do that. The other thing that's required is that the medical board must inform someone when they receive a complaint. So they must go to the practitioner and say, we've received a complaint. And they can only not do that if they decide that it would may prejudice the complainant or the investigation of the complaint. Now, in this case, they didn't tell Dr. Jareth Cock anything when they received the complaint and instead started an investigation without him even knowing and decided not to tell him. There's no real reason why they should have done that. There's no compelling protection of the complainant who was anonymous anyways. So we don't understand that. Mm. The next thing they did was convene as the medical board to look at whether they should use their powers to act immediately. And they decided to do that before they'd even told Dr. Cock about the complaint. 
So it really was a sort of shock and awe campaign against Dr. Koch, whereby he was informed on a Friday afternoon, firstly, that there was a complaint against him that had been investigated for, uh, I think, three or four months beforehand. Secondly, that the medical board had scoured the entire internet to find everything they could that Dr. Koch had ever posted uh, and gave to him two and a half thousand pages of material. Mm. Uh, thirdly, that they were decide they were proposing to take immediate action against him and that the action they were going to take was the most extreme action they could, which was to deregister him during the period that they then investigate those complaints. He was given until the next Wednesday to provide them with a submission. So to review the complaint, to review two and a half thousand pages, to provide a submission. Mm -hmm. And he had to appear before the medical board on the Friday, very next Friday. So within less than seven days of even knowing that his job was under threat. Mm -hmm. So there are some real concerns there about the extent of the powers that have been granted to the medical board about the transparency of how they're using those powers, about uh, the fairness of the process that they're engaged in and whether it gives the doctor, uh, in this case, Dr. Koch, a reasonable opportunity to respond and uh, the proportionality of how they use those powers. Because clearly, if you've never received a complaint from a patient, there is no clinical aspect that's under criticism. Yeah. Why would you suspend a doctor? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so he has been suspended um, as of this moment indefinitely and he's appealed to the Victorian um, Tribunal in March. Uh, what was the result of that uh, yeah. appeal? So he was suspended in August after appearing before the, uh, the medical board. He spent eight months while he appealed the decision of the medical board to the tribunal. He had a tribunal hearing in February and a decision was put, put out by the tribunal at the end of March. And the tribunal, made up of one member of the tribunal and two doctors, uh, made the decision to uphold uh, the decision of the medical board. They said it was in the public interest for the medical board to use these emergency powers to suspend Dr. Koch. Mm. Mm. Okay, so legally, what are your concerns? Um, with this and what is is happening now as of now? Well, my concern is that powers given to the medical board to make sure that doctors are not operating in ways that are detrimental to the health of Australians are being used to pull good doctors out of the medical practice, particularly in times where we can use every single doctor uh, that we can we can get access to during this uh, coronavirus lockdown and crisis. Mm. Uh, it's a use of disciplinary powers to selectively uh, pursue people whose conservative ideas uh, the medical board doesn't like. And it does this all under the wide umbrella of it being in the public interest if you look at the decision of the medical board and of the tribunal, their main concern is that when people see posts of Dr. Koch that are critical of transgender ideology, are critical of, of sexual uh, orientation theory, that that will make ordinary Australians or minority group Australians less likely to get medical treatment and procedure. Mm. Now, be very clear, no one ever showed any evidence that anyone has uh, not gone to a doctor because of the posts. It was merely the board's opinion that it might affect someone going to a doctor that they decided it was in the public interest. Mm. Uh, it's really concerning because it's completely disproportionate mm. uh, to, to the concerns that they raised in relation to these posts. Um. So what about these internet posts? Um, often the, the objection is raised, uh, shouldn't doctors be kept to a certain standard? And now uh, when I'm asking this, I'm thinking of that Jareth Cock has said to the tribunal, I'm willing to take down, and he has, indeed has taken down many of those posts on his personal Facebook page, and uh, he's made every effort that he can to take it down from other sites as well. Um, so he's willing to 
engage with their particular argument, but that obviously is not good enough for them. Yeah, look, an important point to make here is that the only grounds for the medical board taking action was the doctor's social media presence. Right. That was the only thing they were taking action on. And in the face of that action, Dr. Cock did uh, offer mm. or made, he made an undertaking that he would not post at, on social media during the period when this was going to be investigated and a proper trial was going to be held. And he would remove as far as possible posts that they had mm. identified and said were posts that might be offensive. But there's uh, a reasonable um, interest here for doctors to be held to a certain standard when engaging on medicine, when engaging with uh, discussion about the practice of medicine and other doctors that certainly is within the purview of the medical board. And there's no doubt that doctors like other professionals need to uphold certain standards when they present themselves in the public. Now, um, there's no question of that. The question is, how do you deal with expressions that doctors may have made that are not that you find objectionable or which may fall outside the boundaries of uh, politeness, of mm. prudence, of uh, maybe unduly critical? Uh, the answer is not to remove that doctor's livelihood. That's completely disproportionate. Yeah. The answer is education, engagement. The answer is to consult. Mm. And none of that was done. Yeah. Uh, so then what happens now and um, is there there is some uh, opportunity here with regards to the government as the federal government has brought about there's religious discrimination bills and, and things like that that might actually tackle some of these issues um, is Jared Cox pursuing another appeal um, I know that he's he is considering that um, so what, how can we help out people like him? And there have been, as I know, uh, about seven other doctors that have been under investigation in the last few years by the medical board. Some of them have escaped some on techni a technicality. So how can we help people like Dr. Cook? Well, I mean, there's a lot of issues to unpack there, but I guess mm. the first one is that Dr. Cock now has a certain period after getting the decision of the tribunal to decide whether or not he wants to appeal on grounds of law and take this matter further. Mm. The, the issue that he's probably dealing with is this, is that this is a preliminary battle mm -hmm. before the actual hearing of his matter. So at the moment, he would be appealing their use of their powers to act immediately. But that doesn't change the fact that at the moment, he's still under investigation. They haven't gone through with it. And so he has to determine whether he has got the, the, the time, whether he's got the emotional capacity mm -hmm. to run through and take this further, as well as know that there's another battle ahead where he's going to have to meet the accusations of the medical board once they've gone through all of their material to put together a defense for the formal hearing that will eventually occur and then go through that whole process again. So he's got quite a long battle ahead of him. Mm -hmm. He's not able to work during this time and support his family. And the length of that investigation is indeterminate. We don't know when the medical board will finish its investigation and will then commence with some sort of proposed sanction against him and a hearing to determine what that will be. So he really is in a position where he's not able to support his family. He's not able to practice medicine, which he's trained for. He will have had to have um, directed his uh, patients to other doctors and to, to other practices. Uh, and uh, that is a difficult position to be in. And in the middle of all of that, he's going to have to decide, do I want to appeal this original decision? And how much do I want to save for a further decision, uh, mm. for the further investigation? In terms of what people can do now, one of the main things people can do is uh, to start to engage with their federal politicians about the issue of doctors being under threat by the medical board. Dr. Yeah. Cock is not alone. A lot of these, in, these matters don't get into the public eye because they're done within a process that sits within the medical board. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you're right, there are doctors in all of the states and territories who have been targeted because of their political views and their religious views. And oftentimes it's on the basis of anonymous complaints by activists who have been weaponizing the complaints procedure. Mm. So you will have some doctors who've had complaints by uh, overseas activists like the Southern Poverty Law Center. Oh, yeah. An organization that's far left, mm. uh, that's made a complaint and the medical board, instead of ignoring that complaint from a completely a US-based uh, organization, yeah. A US-based organization mm. uh, has instead gone with it and put the doctor to some uh, stress and and and, uh, and some pains to have to defend themselves. Mm. That's ridiculous. And there needs to be uh, a, an increasing voice to our politicians that that needs to change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as we know, with a lot of these cases, they're shifting the burden of proof in some way. In regards to the commentary, what about, about this religious discrimination bill? there is some some kind of provisions in there that may be included. Yeah, there's no question that uh, the religious discrimination bill will be pertinent to these kinds of cases. The difficulty with that is that what it does is it gives you a shield against the sword that the, the medical board is holding. Mm. So to protect doctors, it gives them more law with which they can potentially take legal action against the medical board. Mm -hmm. what's going to be a more effective way of dealing with these is instead of making more law, let's make less law. Let's take away some of the most offending parts of the existing law that are being used to target doctors, to put them under threat and modify it and bring it back within the purposes for which it was first made, which is to make sure that doctors are doing their jobs properly, serving their patients properly. Right. Yeah. So we don't want big government. We want less in the most minimal amount to have protection for Australians to get good medical care. Exactly. Yeah. So thanks for your time today, John. Um, I know we're all quite busy and we're all quite um, got lots of lots of things on the go. So thanks for coming and joining us today. I hope you uh, stay well with your family and hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Daryl. My blessings on you as well. It was good yes. to talk to you. Yeah, good. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> and that was John Steenoff. And thanks so much to John for joining us today. And um, I'll just wrap this up and say to visit our website to read John Sinoff's articles, uh, familyvoice.org.au. If you'd like to donate and support Family Voice, please do so and go onto our Facebook page to continue getting updates from us, uh, facebook.com slash familyvoiceaustralia.